Once again, here we are with the greatest story ever told by an idiot. This is so hard. This is this is hard. But I have been playing Pokemon all day and my Switch needs to recharge, so I figured we'll go ahead and do this. Um, we're on Chapter 9. We're on Chapter 9. Um, I guess let's get our, our YouTuber crap out of the way. Um, let's see, we need a flashy intro and, and to scream a lot. Yeah. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> whatever i don't know <laughs> so so uh i guess there's like and subscribe we've got we've got links we've got we're uh paco peep pot pies on youtube we're magnum pot pie on rumble magnum pot pie on spotify uh, let's see if you would like to donate to us ko-fi is paco peep cash app is magnum pot pie and as of today I created a Teespring. Uh, so, uh, yeah, certainly donations are appreciated, never required. We're trying to use the money to get Paco a laptop so he can do some live streaming. And we just think it's funny to make money off of this idiot. Because that's just great. Because that's just great. Like that That's the thing he's always afraid of and he hates more than anything is thinking that that we're out here making money off of them so it's absolutely hilarious to actually be out here making money off of them so and don't forget join our discord a lot of crazy get fud yeah <laughs> you can't join the discord <laughs> you're too young yes the things on there yes links to everything will be in the description there'll be our link tree in the description paco will post the straight up links in the comments and uh, I guess now that we've wasted enough time, let's get into this amazing tale. I'm so not ready for this, actually. So, so the little bit of recap is that Aaron um, kicked his wife out of bed, and they 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 talked about it over ham, presumably. And, he, <laughs> and milk. And milk, yes, and milk. Um, let's see. And he decided to go for a walk to clear his head. Huh. And uh, there we are. Now we we join our hero while he's on a walk, clearing his big, hollow, empty head. And I'm sure this is going to be a nice, long walk. Lots of thinking. Get more to get to know him better. I'm sure. Oh yeah. Aaron walked along until he came to a bridge. He rested his arms on the railing, put his head down, and let the tears fall from his eyes. Even Aaron's a crybaby. Lauren's a big crybaby, and so is Aaron. So it was perfect. He needed this walk so that he could think about what Brooke was asking him to do. Because, you know, therapy is such a hard, soul-searching decision to make. Absolutely. Yeah. After about 45 minutes of thinking, walking, and releasing the tears, Aaron returned back to the house. Well, I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> he paused and took a deep breath, then opened the door and walked in the house. Brooke was on the floor in the living room playing with Trevor when Aaron appeared. She looked up at him with a loving look that told Aaron what he had to do. I'll call and make an appointment first thing Monday morning, he said. Thank you, baby. Brooke returned as she got to her feet and gave him a long hug and a passionate kiss. <laughs> I, I remember you used the Winnie voice, but I forgot. Nah. Same, same time. God, I love that voice. If you keep kissing me like that, we could end up with another one of them. Aaron said as he pointed toward Trevor. Not for a couple more years we can't, eh? Brooke said firmly. I can call and make the appointment with the psychiatrist for you eh, while you're at work. Meh. She stated while the subject was still close. <laughs> mm, okay. Mm, that would make it easier on me, he agreed. Sorry, the buds are over here being buggy and that's just distracting me. Just, what are you doing? Go. Stop. <laughs> I'm very forceful with them. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's why they bully us. Yeah. Monday morning came, and Aaron headed off to work after kissing his wife and son goodbye. At 10 o'clock, Brooke called and made an appointment with the psychiatrist for Aaron, then called Aaron at work to let him know. 
Let's see. I'm, I'm trying. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, 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 um. Mm. <clears throat> let's see. Hello, this is John. <laughs> A man answered. I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. I can't. I, I'm sorry. I'm just drawing a complete blank here. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I've got a great voice. I'm saying for saving for the psychiatrist. Do you want me to do him? Yeah. You. You. You go ahead and do him. I. I can't call to mind any of these. Wait a minute. Hello. This is John. <laughs> I'm fat. <laughs> that man answered. Yeah. You better. You better do it because it's Brooke. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, if we were if we were better at this, we'd have figured this out beforehand. But that's no fun. Yeah, we suck. Well, well. <laughs> okay. You, all right. Pretend nobody heard any of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Wait. Now I'm trying to blank. You just you just have to you just have to greet me. My switch my thing turned off here. Hmm. Hold on. Let me figure it. Hello, this is John. <laughs> How's that? That works, right? A man answered. Hi, John. This is Brookie. Is that sexy, fat, bald pedophile eh, right there? Eh? Brookie asked. We're <laughs> 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 <was> so smooth. <laughs> No, he hasn't, John replied. He went to a hospital. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> did we did we miss that? No. <laughs> went to the hospital? <laughs> Why did he go to the hospital? Is he all right? Eh? Broke with a worried tone and went, meh. <laughs> well, John began, he had a little accident. <laughs> what happened to him, man? Brooke pressed. Because <laughs> that's what life with Winnie would be like. You'd be on the floor, like, sliced open an artery. She'd be laughing her head off. He cut a finger and had to get it bandaged. John answered. Knowing no. that Aaron had cut his finger off, he didn't believe it would be a good idea to inform Aaron's wife with that much detail at the time, so he kept it simple without lying. Only in Lord's world <laughs> is any of that. Like, first off, first off, the first off, your boss is gonna call your wife to say, "Hey, he just had an accident at work and he's on his way to the hospital." First off, that's gonna happen. Second of all, in what on what planet? Is saying he cut his finger not lying when the guy chopped it off. <laughs> Only Lorne. <laughs> well, see, men don't lie. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We just bend the truth a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Okay, I'm going to the hospital to see him. Thank you, John. Brooke hung up the phone and got Trevor ready to go to the hospital. Before she was able to leave, Aaron's mother walked in because of course she did. Yeah. Hi, Brooke. Are you headed out? She asked. Yes, sir, Brooke answered. Aaron cut his finger and is at the hospital, so I was going there, eh? And okay. So he's trying not to so he tried not to freak a Brooke out. Right. But saying he cut his finger and went to the hospital to get it bandaged. Sounds so stupid because you don't do that I unless it's unless it's cut open to the bone. I cut myself ten times a day at work. I, I come home every day with band aids, you know, and bandages and stuff like that. I have never once gone to the hospital for a cut finger. So that, that that's like when you mangle yourself in the saw or chop it off or something. It's not you don't just go because you got a little cut. Yeah, it's the, it's Lord. the hospital. It's not you know. Ah, oh God, I don't know. Oh God. God. That I sorry oh. that just that got me. I know this is so stupid. It's like God, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can leave Trevor here if you want to, and I'll watch him while you go see Aaron. His mother offered. 
Oh, thank you so much. Eh? You're such a big help. Eh? Brooke compliment complimented. <laughs> She gave Trevor a hug and kissed goodbye, then walked out the door and drove to the hospital to be with Aaron. Now, if you got the... If someone told you that I cut my finger, would you think you needed to go be with me? No. Right? No. That's... Come on. Come on. And why didn't she call his cell phone? He has a cell phone. They had sex. Does it only <laughs> last a certain amount of time? And they have to have sex. It dissolves. You, you get yeah, it dissolves. You, I'm surprised you don't know this. You are the vending machine. Yeah, right. I'm surprised I, you haven't noticed when I'm like, oh fuck, my cell phone's almost gone. Come on, Paco. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering where you get your cell phone. I have never tell him. <laughs> oh God. Once she arrived at the hospital, she walked up to the front desk and asked the lady in reference to Aaron. He's in surgery right now, ma'am, the secretary replied. Are you his wife? Brooke's face turned pale. What do you mean he's in surgery? He only came in here because he cut his finger. Brooke exhausted. <laughs> God, the English teacher is going to have so much trouble with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Are you his wife, ma'am? <laughs> Secretary asked again. Boy, Kayla's just everywhere. Like, sassy Kayla's just everywhere. Yeah. Yes, I am. Will you please tell me where he's in surgery when he only cut his finger? Brooke asked anxiously. Well, he did cut his finger. So whoever told you that wasn't lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. What? <laughs> but what they neglected to tell you, because he's a fucking dumbass, and I'm guessing he did it on purpose, was he cut his finger off? The secretary answered. Wait, why is it a secretary? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Wait, I, that's right. This doesn't take place on Earth. This is somewhere out in the Federation somewhere. <laughs> He what? Brooke asked in disbelief. How much? <laughs> nah, how much longer will be in surgery? I don't know. The secretary answered. <laughs> but I can take you to where the operating room is. You wait outside if you want to, or don't. I don't care. Yes, please. Brooke returned. After the secretary left Brooke outside the operating room. Brooke decided she'd better call Aaron's mother and let her know what was going on. She walked around until she found the cafeteria and the pay phone, then made the call. So she gets, she's just, she's got to rely on pay phones. Well, I mean, I told you that's how, that's how cell phones work in this world. I understand, Aaron's mother said, trying to ease Brooke's concern. Stay right there and wait. I'll stay right here with the baby for as long as you need me to. Brooke hung up the phone after thinking Aaron's mother and made her way back to the outside of the operating room and waited. Two hours went by when finally the doctor came out of the operating room. Good Lord, your hysterectomy <laughs> wasn't that long. No. Two hours, good God. Not that I remember much. Yeah, you don't remember much about it. Or their trip home. Or all the things you called those birds and stuff. When when Paco, I gotta tell this story. Paco, she she went for one of her surgeries. Paco had endometriosis, and she had several surgeries for it. And one of the surgeries she went for, when we were coming back home, we had this plan that that she, we were going to stop someplace and get something to eat. And I was like, well, that's not going to happen when I got this dope head in my car. <laughs> so we're heading back. And she sees the Swift truck on the road, and it says, best in class. And she goes, that's a lie. That bitch isn't best in class. That's Lord Armstrong. He's driving truck. He's not best in class. And I'm just going, okay, okay. I'm just laughing at this, right? And I'm going, where am I going to take Dopey McGee for, <laughs> for, for lunch? And then my boss calls. <laughs> and she's like, can I call him a bitch? I'm like, no. She's like, do I need to keep my mouth shut? I'm like, yes. Yeah. So then she clamps both her hands over her mouth. My boss calls me. 
and he, and I talk, I'm talking to my boss, and and she's over there just making noise, and she's over there going. So he's like, what's that? So I explained to him that, you know, that I'd just gotten out of surgery with this idiot and I had to take her for <laughs> for some food. And he's like, okay, get off the phone. And so she looks over at me. I'm like, okay. And she goes, bitch, 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 bitch. Because <laughs> everyone and everything was a bitch. So we end up at McDonald's. <laughs> And I get her a French fry, and she's sitting there. We pull up. I'm not taking her in the place. You know, I so, don't know why. So we pull up, and there had been this bird picking at uh, French fries or something. And, and so she's like, can I feed the bird? And I'm like, the birds are, you know what, sure, go for it. So she grabs up a whole hand, like half of her fries, and flings them out the car window where the bird was. And then she was very upset when the bird didn't come back and eat all these fries i still occasionally hear about how that bird was a bitch it was a bitch i gave it fucking dinner i don't know why i'm on a tangent about that but it's more interesting than this book i'm not gonna lie about that one. <laughs> oh god okay so two hours <clears throat> hi i'm aaron's wife is he gonna be all right yeah, brooke Asked the doctor anxiously. Yes, he is. The doctor replied. He won't have full use of his finger, but he'll have most of it, he explained. Can I see him, please? Uh, Brooke asked. You can see him in about 30 to 45 minutes. They have to wheel him to a room. Then it will take about that long before he starts coming out of the sedation. Okay, so he does at least have the, the idea that you don't talk to someone the second you're done with surgery, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, doctor. Brooke waited outside the operating room until they wheeled Aaron out in the bed. She followed behind them to the room they wheeled Aaron into. Once they had his bed in place and the wheels locked, they brought Brooke a chair she sat there and waited, holding Aaron's good hand until he woke up. When he began to come out of the sedation, Brooke scooted her chair up to be closer to Aaron's face. He was surprised to see her there when he opened his eyes. Mm, how did you know I was here? He asked her in a tired voice. John told me. Only he told me he cut, you cut your finger. I didn't find out you cut your finger off. Until I got here, and she spoke calmingly. <laughs> just imagining Winnie trying to be calming. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm, I asked him not to tell you too much if you called while I was gone. So wait, this idiot's plan was he was going to go off for surgery and come back with his hand all bandaged up? And she's going to be like, what happened, baby? Was, and he was going to be, mm, nothing. And was his boss going to go and pick him up from the hospital? He can't drive himself. <laughs> uh, mm, Aaron said with a smile, mm, where's the baby? He's at home, man. Your gorilla face mother drove in just as I was leaving and offered to watch him, man, so I could come here with your. So come here with free hands to, to be with you. What a weird way to put that. Yeah. Brooke answered. Meh. So how did you cut your finger off, baby? See, there was a hatchet. And... Yeah. Mm, it was stupid, really, he returned. I was cutting a piece of metal. When I got lost in my thoughts and wasn't paying attention to where my finger was until it was too late, he explained with disgust in his voice from his lack of attention. Aaron didn't want to let Brooke know that what he was thinking about when he got lost in his thoughts was being over in Iraq. Bullshit, I bet he was thinking about last night's episode of My Little Pony. <laughs> this is just the guy. He guessed that last nightmare he had affected him more than he cared to let on. You know, our kid's streaming in the other room, so I bet the people watching him stream are hearing us read this book. Too bad it's not the Lornography, darn I know, right? God, let's go Let's go get a chat log real quick. <laughs> Let's dig my penis in your vagina. <laughs> really? You want to do that? Yes, I do. How could I not want to? 
wow, it's so big. <laughs> God, that poor kid. <laughs> Where do you want my penis first? <laughs> Mm, do you like my penis and my balls more? <laughs> well, mm, I can't put my balls inside you, so I guess you like my penis. <laughs> it's so quiet in the other room now. <laughs> oh, God. Anything to keep from reading this book, huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well... At least the doctor was able to put it back on, so you'll be able to have most of the use of it again. Yeah. Brooke stated. The doctor wanted Aaron to stay in the hospital overnight in case there was any complications with the stitches staying in place. Also, his bandages had to be changed every two hours, the first 24 hours. So with Aaron in the hospital, the nurses would be able to do that without disturbing the stitches. I bet one of his cellies had hand surgery. Yeah. Brooke called Aaron's mother to let her know that she'd be there with Aaron and they would be home the next day. She also talked to Aaron about the appointment with the psychiatrist, Dr. Jeffs, which she made for him and let him know that his appointment was on Friday at 2 p.m. Aaron said he was fine with that and accepted her kiss with want before Brooke left the room so Aaron could sleep. Aaron woke up the next morning. When Aaron woke up the next morning, Brooke was asleep in the corner chair. The nurse walked in without waking Brooke and gave Aaron his pain medication and then left just as quietly as she came in. Why did Brooke have to leave the room so Aaron could sleep then? If, yeah, if she's just sleeping right there. Yeah. <sighs> Aaron turned the TV you need your on. your privacy, baby? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron turned the TV on and began watching the news while Brooke was still asleep. The anchor man was talking about the Iraq War, and Aaron got engrossed in the update and got lost in the videos they were showing. Aaron began sweating, and his eyes became wet with tears as he grew more involved in the videos. He didn't snap out of it until the camera turned back to the anchor man and then to a commercial. It was then that Aaron realized he was soaked in sweat and that his bandage had become red with blood. He reached over and pressed the button for the nurse. A few moments later, a nurse came in and saw Aaron's bandage. What, when is this uh, When is this book taking place? Because, I mean, we both lived through the invasion of Iraq and everything. Like, it wasn't constantly just you turn on the news and there was just video after video after video. Like... It wasn't like the the first few like maybe few weeks of the war or something, but certainly not by the point that you know we had a peacekeeping force there or something like during the actual invasion it was constantly there. But when is I don't know I do not understand the time period this book is supposed to take place in. I don't know. I mean it's obviously around the invasion or the invasion and the and the occupation of Iraq, but it's not. Like, people don't commonly have cell phones. It's it's very weird. It's a very weird time that this book takes place in. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we better get a new bandage on your finger, the nurse said quietly, so not to wake up Brooke. <laughs> Once the nurse had his bandage off, she realized that three of his stitches had come apart and needed to be fixed. How? <laughs> Because it was so stressful with the war, I guess. I guess. She got the doctor in to replace the stitches, and then she put a fresh bandage on him. Brooks slept through the whole thing, and even another hour after the nurse had left, because those hospital chairs are so comfortable. Oh, God. When she woke up, she moved to a different, smaller chair, <laughs> moved it up to Aaron's bed, and held his hand. What? I don't know. What, that chair was just too goddamn comfortable? Good morning, yeah, she said as she gave him a kiss. Mm, good morning back to you, he returned. Can't even with this book. Did the doctor say when you'll be able to leave, yeah, she asked. That's the doctor. Yeah. Uh, the fucking doctor! He can leave anytime he's ready to now, the doctor said from the doorway, startling Brooke. I'm ready to go right now, Aaron replied. Okay, 
I nearly said it more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let the nurse change that bandage one more time, and I'll write you a prescription for the pain. Then you can sign some papers and be on your way, the doctor stated. All right, Aaron replied as he smiled and winked at his wife. When is the murders going to happen? Right, can this we get to so the murders? <laughs> I think some people need to die. Come on now. On the way home, they stopped by the pharmacy to pick up Aaron's prescription medication. He took one as soon as he got home and fell asleep about ten minutes later. When he woke up, it was dinner time, and Aaron was starving. He made his way to the table where Brooke had a plate of mashed potatoes, peas, and spare ribs waiting for him. Wait, where's the ham? Well, I mean, he got ribs, so he does have pork. Did he at least get milk? I'm sure that's milk. I, I'm certain there's milk. So there, there's somebody here. There, there's somebody that uh, that that's listening to this that loves all of the milk drinking in this. Yes. Yep. Dad. Say it with more of a British accent. He's a British baby after all. Da. <laughs> Did I do it right? I cheerio. I'm terrible. How about, how about instead he goes cheerio? <laughs> Trevor let out. Cheerio, pip pip, and all that. <laughs> right, though, Governor. How about the spot of spare ribs? <laughs> God, we're, we suck. <laughs> we're terrible at this. Aaron stretched a finger out to Trevor and flicked his nose. Trevor giggled when Aaron pulled it back and began eating. After they were, this is so hard. After they were finished eating, Aaron helped Brooke clean off the table and clean up Trevor. The table... Telephone. <laughs> okay. Right, 87 right. Brain. Okay, take over for a sec. The telephone rang just as they sat down to watch a movie and to get Trevor settled for the night. Those are two different things. Yeah, that you don't... Say... He, he does not have kids, obviously. Yeah. Hello, eh? Brooke answered the phone. Hi, Brooke, this is Mom. <laughs> I just wanted to see how Aaron is doing. Wait, why the fuck isn't she there? Right. This is the one time it would make sense for her to be walking through the door. He's doing good, eh? And wouldn't she have seen when he got home? She had been there with the baby. No, no, no. The baby was just left there. She put it. She put the baby in his play cage and, <laughs> and left. The play cage is electrified. He's doing good, eh? He's right here. Would you like to talk to him, eh? Brooke asked. No, I know you two probably have Trevor all settled down, so I don't want to interrupt that. Just let him know that I'll call him again in the morning and see if he's okay, she finished. Okay. I'll talk to you tomorrow then, eh? Bye, eh? Brooke hung up the phone and returned to Aaron's side on the couch and watched the movie. Because they just punted the baby out the room, yeah. I guess. And the movie, I'm guessing, has got to be Rocky. <laughs> Probably Rocky, you know. I don't know. Around 9 p.m., they happily retreated to bed. During the night, Aaron began tossing and turning from the nightmares that were haunting his sleep almost every night now. Brooke woke up from being poked in the side by Aaron's elbow and turned the lamp on dim on her side of the bed. She felt her heart rate launch upward at an astounding rate when she looked down at the sheets on Aaron's side and found them soaked with blood and sweat. And probably urine. Gross. Baby! She spoke softly and shook him. Baby! She said a second time as she shook him more. Aaron sat up quickly, breathing deep, heavy breaths, and found himself soaked in sweat and his finger throbbing in pain. Your finger is bleeding bad. We need to change your bandage. You got blood all over the sheets, Brooke exclaimed. <laughs> what was that? I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to get Winnie's inflections a little bit here. Oh. Win See, Winnie is not the kind that would find any of this alarming. I just can't do her laugh because Winnie would be finding this absolutely hilarious. Brooke fetched a cold washcloth and a wet towel. She laid the towel down on Aaron's lap for it. Why did it have to be wet? 
<laughs> she had the washcloth. For him to put his bloody finger on, then wipe the sweat from his forehead. You were having another nightmare about the war, weren't you, eh? Brooke asked knowingly. Mm, I wish I could say no. Mm, but yeah, I did. Aaron answered. I'm sorry, baby. I wish I could make them go away. Eh? Brooke said with concern. Mm, hopefully going... To the psychiatrist will help. Maybe you should have been doing that all along, huh? Like, like maybe when you got when you left Iraq from the mental health facility, and somehow didn't get a discharge from the service for that. You know, maybe maybe you should have been continuing treatment. Yeah. Maybe that would have been a good idea. But no, I think Ham will do it. <laughs> Brooke retrieved a new bandage for Aaron's finger and changed it for him, then got him a glass of water and one of his pain pills. They cleaned up the blood on the bed and put new bedding on and then climbed back into bed. In no time at all, Aaron was sound asleep again thanks to the help of the pain pill. Brooke wished that she could also fall back to sleep, but instead she lay there with her eyes open and her hand resting on Aaron's chest as she stared at him with tears rolling from her eyes and onto her pillow. Everyone does a lot of crying. Mm. Her concern about Aaron's nightmares were beginning to scare her. She was afraid of what his nightmares could do to him, or worse, what they could do to their family and their marriage. She didn't fall back to sleep until around 4.30 a.m., then woke up again at 6 when Trevor started yelling from his crib, Mother! <laughs> Aaron woke up around 8 a.m. because his dumbass couldn't be bothered with the kid and poured himself a cup of coffee. Brooke changed his bandage again while Aaron quietly drank his coffee. Something had changed in Aaron that night, and Brooke could see it in the way he acted. The whole day he remained quiet and to himself. She could tell he was depressed and upset about his nightmares. That made her depressed because she didn't know how to help him. Friday rolled around and Aaron went to the psychiatrist. Not because he wanted to, but because he promised Brooke he would. When he returned home, Brooke asked him how it went. Mm, he wants to see me twice a week for intense therapy, Aaron answered with a surly tone in his voice. Oh God, not the intense therapy. I like the surly tone because clear that, that indicates he clearly doesn't think he needs it, even though he's having multiple nightmares every night and bleeding all over the place. Yeah. You don't sound very happy about that. Are you going to do it, eh? she asked. I'm not very happy about it, no. I'm not very happy about anything I'm going through right now. I thought I was past it all. Mm, but it's all coming back to me, mm, like it just happened yesterday. I mean, maybe if you didn't sit down to CNN's 24-hour coverage of the occupation of Iraq, you'd be fine. Right? God damn. Are you going to do the intense therapy? Brooke asked him again. Yes, mm, I'm going to do it for us, he answered. <laughs> mm, my psychiatrist told me not to expect great things because of what I went through in Iraq and the things I've witnessed. He made me no guarantees that he could get me back to normal again, Aaron finished. You know, the way he phrased that is like, yeah, basically the psychiatrist is just going to milk me for my money because there's fuck all he can do. Yeah, the, the psychiatrist is like, well, you know, you're pretty fucked up. I mean, you're going to be fucked up. I mean, that's it. I mean, best I can do is maybe unfuck you a little. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Very professional. Yeah. That's why I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> There's a lot of professions you're not for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> Brooke walked up to Aaron and wrapped her arms around him. He wanted to be the person she'd fell in love with, but he wasn't sure if he would ever be able to be that person again. He wrapped his arms around her in a loving embrace and held on tight. Brooke could feel the heat from Aaron's body as they held each other and could feel the emotion coming out in him. And it began to make her eyes tear up because everybody's a great big fucking crybaby in this book. She didn't want to lose her man to these bad memories. 
That night, she began praying for God to help Aaron let go of the bad things that happened and hold on to the good ones and let her keep her husband that she fell in love with. God, that was a sentence. Over the next couple of months, Aaron continued to go to an is intense therapy sessions with the psychiatrist. The sessions appeared to be helping him. He still had some nightmares and still got lost in his thoughts at work and at home. But Brooke thought her prayers were on their way to being answered, and she was going to have her husband back. Brooke woke up one morning to the smell of bacon, eggs, and hash browns cooking on the stove. She rolled out of bed and found her way to the kitchen, where she plopped down at the table. Aaron delivered her breakfast and a hot cup of coffee, along with a kiss and a, mm, Good morning, honey. I didn't know this guy could cook. She looked up at him through sleepy eyes and returned, Good morning, baby. You seem happy this morning. His mom snuck out the back. Yeah. Bye, Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't I be happy when I'm married to the most beautiful woman in the world? Ah, that's sweet, honey. Uh, thank you. But you can be honest because... With me just crawling out of bed, I know I must not look that good, eh? She replied. You do to me? Aaron replied, kissing her on the lips. Thank you, sweetie, eh? She said as she kissed him back. What are you going to do today? Brooke asked as, he began as she began chewing on a piece of bacon. Well, today is the first day of deer hunting season. Mm, so I thought I'd get my permit and see if I can find us some deer meat. Mm, that is if you don't mind. The way he said that. Like, I'm going to go get my permit and then I'm going to scroll through the grocery store yeah. and get some deer meat. Kind of like that year, that first year I shot us a turkey at Thanksgiving. Yeah. Scared the shit out of everybody in the frozen section. Yeah, you were banned from that shop. Yeah. Aaron replied with hope that Brooke would approve. Yeah, you know, I, I'm only going to going to intensive therapy twice a week for my PTSD and nightmares, and I'm going to become a murderer here shortly, so you mind if I carry a gun and walk around in the woods? Yeah, not a problem. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind, eh? I, I was going to take Trevor over to your mother's and go shopping with her today anyway, she answered. Is she, like, an orphan? I, yeah, I mean, her family is... I think there was one brief throwaway line in the beginning saying that she didn't have any family. Yeah. After they finished eating breakfast, they both got their showers taken, and Brooke got Trevor dressed as Aaron prepared himself a lunch and cleaned his gun and then dressed himself in his old green army BDUs, field jacket, and orange vest. He drove to the town hall and got his hunting permit, then returned home, gave Brooke a kiss, and headed off into the woods in search of a deer to kill. Why did he do it that way? I know. I don't know. Yeah. Aaron walked for about an hour until he was deep in the woods and knew he'd be able to find a nice-sized buck. He made his seed at the trunk of a large old pine tree and poured himself a cup of steaming hot coffee from his thermos. Of course he did. He looked up into the branches of some neighboring trees and watched some squirrels jumping from branch to branch up and down the trunk of the tree as if, as if they were playing tag with each other. He took a sip of coffee and absorbed the heat it supplied on his nose mm. as he tilted the small cup to his mouth. He drinks enough coffee. I think he, I think he would realize you're not supposed to have the coffee actually on your nose. You'd think. Yeah. The morning had a bitter chill, but Aaron was enjoying it. A couple of hours went by, and Aaron hadn't seen a thing as the day grew warmer. He began to think to he began to think to himself, "Maybe hmm. I should try a different spot." He pushed the thought from his head and remained in his original chosen spot because he had a feeling that his patience would pay off. He enjoyed his surroundings as he sat there eating his lunch and swallowing another cup of hot coffee. Once again, he began watching the same two squirrels that had entertained him earlier. In the distance, he heard a cracking sound. A sound a dead branch makes when it's stepped on. 
Then he heard some rustling of dead fallen leaves. He slowly set down his cup of coffee, quietly picked up his gun, and rested it on his thigh. Looking in the direction of the noise, he spotted a small raccoon. Aaron relaxed his tense muscles at the sight of the raccoon. He was bummed out for a few seconds because he thought the sound was because he thought the sound was made by the raccoon. <laughs> then he glanced up about a foot and a half above the raccoon and spotted a very large buck standing strong, approximately 30 feet away from the raccoon. Aaron's muscles tensed up again as he lifted the gun to his shoulder, took aim, and fired. A split second after pulling the trigger on the gun, the large buck dropped to the ground. Aaron smiled at his success as he lifted himself off the ground and trampled through the small bushes to where the buck had fallen down dead. He reached down behind him and unsnapped the buckle that secured his buck knife to its scabbard and pulled the knife out. As he looked down at the buck, he noticed it was still breathing as he watched small puffs of vapor depart from his nostrils. Aaron kneeled down and gripped the knife tightly in his hands and placed the blade of the knife against the buck's neck. He made a small grunt as he pressed the blade in and slid it across the buck's neck. Watching the skin spread apart and thick red blood filled the split area. Somehow, watching the life fade from the animal's eyes and seeing the blood flow from his body intrigued Aaron and made him enjoy what he had just accomplished. It took his mind back to Iraq when he was killing the enemy, because I'm sure he did a lot of throat slitting with that. Mm -hmm. He felt a small release of satisfaction in the murder of the animal and wished he could make another kill, but the law only permitted a person to kill one deer each. Aaron gutted the deer where it lay to make it easier to carry back to the house. Once he got it back, he hung it upside down from a branch on a maple tree to drain all the excess blood. The next couple of weeks, Brooke noticed that Erin was becoming the man she fell in love with again, and she gave credit to the psychiatrist for the success. Erin had once again began working about 55 hours every week, and being the husband and father, Brooke knew he could be. He would come home, eat supper, spend time with Trevor, and read to him before he went to bed. On most nights after Trevor was asleep, Aaron would bring Brooke a glass of wine in bed and make love to her before they would wrap themselves in each other's arms and fall asleep. Brooke was the happiest woman in the world, did everything she could to let Aaron know how she felt about him and about their lives together. She felt like Cinderella, was happy to see her fairy tale coming true. Aaron continued his intense therapy, even though he didn't think he needed it. He knew it made Brooke feel better, and that was enough for him. One night, he came home to an unexpected large meal with wine and candlelight. Mm, what's all this for? Aaron asked with a, small, with a smile on his face. Well, I guess you've forgotten that we met two years ago on this day, baby, Brooke answered. Mm, I'm sorry, honey. Mm, I didn't mean to forget. Aaron apologized graciously. You're a pedophile, eh? Brooke <laughs> retorted. <laughs> I expected you to forget, eh? <laughs> so, I guess that means I'm forgiven, Aaron asked with hope. Yeah, this time, eh? Just don't let it happen again, Mer Brooke returned. Yes, ma'am, Aaron cajoled, then pulled her into a long, passionate kiss. What do you want to bet that meal has wine, <laughs> or has, has, has ham? Oh, God, yeah. I bet it has ham. Oh, let's see. They ate their meal and drank their wine and enveloped each other <laughs> the rest of the night. <laughs> Never to, I never. Well, no, I, I'm not a single-celled <laughs> organism. I'm sorry. <laughs> and enveloped each other the rest of the night until they fell asleep. They only got interrupted by Trevor's waking up one time during the night, and Aaron went to check on him so that Brooke could stay in bed and sleep. Time went by, and Aaron had been faithfully going to see the psychiatrist for the last six months. He was tired of going to intense therapy. 
His aggravation began to show one night when he unintentionally snapped at Brooke. What's wrong, eh? Brooke asked in astonishment. Mm, I don't know. Mm, I guess I'm just tired mm, of going to see the psychiatrist mm, two times a week. So, tell the psychiatrist that you want to stop intense therapy and go only once every two weeks, eh? Brooke stated, feeling secure about her suggestion because she felt that Aaron had been back to himself for quite some time, so she thought he was basically cured. Yeah, let's go from two times a week to once every two yeah, weeks. Yeah, to twice a month, yeah. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect step down. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, are you sure... You're all right with that, he asked her. Yeah? You've been your old self almost since you first started seeing the psychiatrist. So if you feel good about it, then I trust your feelings. Brooke replied and gave him a kiss on the lips. All right. I'll let the psychiatrist know at my next session, he told her with a smile and returned her kiss with one of his own. These people kiss each other a lot when they're having just conversations that are not in any way romantic. Yeah. It's it's very, it's odd. Aaron did as she said, and stopped his intense therapy sessions with the psychiatrist. He set it up so that he went twice a month to see the psychiatrist, even though Dr. Jeffs didn't think it was a good idea to reduce the sessions just yet. He had dealt with other people that showed similar signs as Aaron had shown and had even seen a couple of them commit suicide after one and a half years of intense therapy. He didn't want to see the same thing that happened to Aaron. He knew he was a good young man with a wife and son and didn't want that to get lost unnecessarily. He prayed for Aaron after he left his office to head back home and hoped he would change his mind in the near future. If only Lorne was half as devout as the people in this book, Mm -hmm. we wouldn't even know his name. Aaron returned home feeling confident that he made the right decision about reducing his therapy sessions. After dinner that night, Aaron read to Trevor, then retired to bed early, even though Brooke stayed up to watch a movie she'd been waiting to see that was on television. Aaron felt... This is in quotations. No, No, it can't be. I think that quotation mark is a mistake. Yeah, no, it, no, it's not. It's it's basically his dream. I peeked ahead on this one. Oh, okay. Because I, I was confused by that, too. Aaron felt himself running with Trevor in his arms and Brooke following behind him. He had his M16 rifle in his left arm with the strap pressing hard against the base of his neck and shoulder. His buck knife swung loose on the bottom and slammed against the side of his leg with every stride he took. And his feet were killing him because of the uncomfortable sole on his combat boots. Aaron and his family were in the open and were easy targets. He needed to find a place for them to hide. Some place fast where he knew they would be safe. Aaron kept looking behind him as he ran. The blast came while he was turning to face forward again. He couldn't feel himself running anymore. Everything around was invisible because of a thick cloud of dust. He looked at his arms to find his son no longer there. Where is he? He shouted. Trevor! The dust cleared just enough that he could see an outline of Brooke on the ground laying flat. No! He yelled. Brooke! He screamed out. He tried to run to her, but realized he was paralyzed. What was holding him? Why couldn't he move? He pushed himself up by his arms and looked down to find his legs gone. Aaron began taking deep, panicking breaths, then screamed. Quad! (laughs) Perfect. Yeah. He sat up straight in bed, soaked in sweat from the nightmare he just had. He put his hands down to his legs to ensure himself it was a dream. Running his hands up and down them, he took a deep sigh of relief and whispered, Thank you, Quad, and then put his hands to his forehead to wipe the sweat away. He struggled to get out of bed because the nightmare had taken a lot of his energy. Finally, he made it to the bathroom, turned the light on, and took a quick shower to wash away the nightmare and sweat before Brooke came to bed. After drying off, Aaron took a long look at himself in the large mirror. 
Did I make the right choice in my reducing my sessions with a psychiatrist? He asked himself. Then he gave in to the decision he had already made earlier that day. Yeah. He said in a whisper. Mm, this was just a fluke that I had a nightmare again. Mm, it'll pass. The next morning, Aaron woke up feeling better than ever. He made breakfast for him and Brooke and Trevor, then decided that because it was Saturday and he wasn't working today, that he and his family should go to the zoo. Trevor had never been to the zoo, and it would be neat for him to see all the different animals. He wowed at the bears and awed at the lions and all the other different animals that were there. The fun-filled day had tired Trevor out to the point where any possibility of him waking up the whole night was impossible. Well, yeah, this kid's like two now. Aaron laid him in his crib when they got home, and now, two hours later, he was ready for bed himself. Aaron slept great through the whole night, but woke up with a pounding headache and an urge to just be completely left alone. He got out of bed so not to wake Brooke, made himself a thermos of coffee, of course, mm -hmm. and a couple of sandwiches, then left Brooke a note. Dear Brooke, no, I woke up with a pounding headache this morning, and it felt and I felt like being alone. No, I made myself a thermos full of coffee and a couple sandwiches. Please don't worry, honey. No, I'll be back before dark. No, I just need to be alone for today. No, I love you. Aaron. Aaron placed the note on the table, grabbed his rifle and knife, and quietly walked out the door. He didn't have any intention of hunting. He just took his rifle for his own protection. Dun, 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 dun. And mercifully, that's the end of chapter nine. <sighs> oh, Thank Lord. God. Oh, yes. Oh, that was a rough one, but I think we get to the murders next. I think I think he's got his rifle because he's about to begin killing. Hopefully, so, there's only three chapters left. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I recommend that everybody who's been listening to this go get intense therapy. And uh, a word of advice from Magnum Pot Pie is if you do cut your finger off at work, let your wife know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah do you, you, you got anything to add to this? or Make yourself a giant thermos of coffee. It helps with everything. Yeah. So and I, drink your milk. Yeah, so say goodnight, Gracie. <laughs> kiss, kiss.